Hi, I'm Chris from SQL for Automation. In this tutorial video, I'm going to show you how you can connect a Siemens PLC to an SQL database using our SQL for Automation connector. And with the connection, we will be able to send and receive data, execute store procedures, and do basically everything you could also do using a normal query to the database. The only additional thing you'll need is our connector service, which you can run on the computer where the server is running or on a different device in the same network. So yeah, let's start. If you want to follow along, I recommend you install the connector and server first. You can watch our first video to see how I installed the connector. Just make sure to select the correct PLC type. And our fifth video to see how I installed the server. To show you how the connection works, I'm going to use an example project, which you can download on our website or from a link in the description. To download the project from the website, you can go to sqlforautomation.com, click on download, select your PLC, fill out the form and click on this link and you will receive the download link via email. And alongside the example you'll also get our connector software. Now the project is written in TF13 but I'll use the version 15 instead. So I'll start the portal first and then open the project from there. The portal should now automatically detect that we are using a newer version and upgrade the project. And then after it's open, we can go to our project view and we should find this layout. My setup is a little bit different than the one in the example project. So as a first step, I want to change the device configuration. To do it, I can open this folder and go to device configuration to see the setup. Now I don't have this object here, so I can delete it. And since I'm using a different PLC, I select this one, click on change device. Then search the one I'm using and click OK. Next, I'm going to assign an IP address to my device. There are a few different ways in which you can do this. One way is by going to online access and selecting the network interface for which you are connected to the PLC. Then we double click on update accessible devices. And there we go, here's our PLC. Next, we can double click here, go to functions and assign IP address. Then in here I can enter the IP address I want the PLC to have, enter the default subnet mask and assign it. Now I also need to change the IP address of my computer. That's because we need to be in the same subnet as the PLC in order to connect to it. One way to do this is by going to our network settings, change adapter options, select the correct network device, go to properties, internet protocol version 4, properties, and changing these numbers to be the same as in our PLC, except the last one. Now let's also change the IP address in the project. Go to device configuration, double click the Ethernet port, and change these values to the address it shows before. Then I can right click on my CPU, go to compile and rebuild the hardware. Then we click here again, select download and download hardware. And in here I select my interface type, the interface and the slot I'm using and start to search for my device. And there we go, here's my PLC, so I can load. Check the settings and click load again. And just like that we've configured our device. In our program structure we do have a few different elements. Some of them are necessary for the connection to work and shouldn't be changed. And some of them are examples to show you how you can set up the program. Now at the base we have our main organization block which continuously gets called by our operating system, for example every millisecond. And then this cyclic interrupt block which gets called every 10 milliseconds. So the way it basically works is that in our main block, or let's say our user program, we put together a request string and store it in a global data block. And then every 10 milliseconds this cyclic interrupt block will process the data and depending on the data communicate with the connector. And the only thing we have to provide for that are some parameters like the IP and ports and so on. So the way you put together your user program is up to you. You can directly call these S4A functions from the main block if you want. Now we don't recommend that and we've put together a few example programs which you can use as templates or to test the functions. 
So let's take a look at them. If we open our main block, we will find, well, not much. As you can see, it's just calling these four functions. Now each of these functions corresponds to one example we've prepared. And we do have two examples, each written in SCL and ladder. So in total, four functions. And they are being called one after the other. So now let's just look at the first function. If you open up this first group here, we will find our function and alongside it, four function blocks and four instance data blocks. Now each of these function blocks corresponds to one of our basic SQL queries, the select, insert, delete and update. And each function block has an instance data block assigned to it in which it can store values. So our main block is calling this function. So let's open it up. Now in here we have four main sections and we can see that each section corresponds to one of these queries. Now in each of these sections we call an instance of our function block and by that assign data to its corresponding data block. And if we take a closer look, we can see that it's the same data every time. So what is this data? The data is coming from this global data block, which you can find in here, and it's stored in this custom data structure. And if we go to PLC data types, SQL for Siemens, we can find the definition of the structure and the variables it contains. Like for example, the execute interface and the request and response data. So each of our function blocks is accessing the same data and can just read, but also change it. So just like before, by calling the instance of that function block, we are executing the code of that function block. So let's open one up. Now, normally, every time this function block gets called, nothing much happens. It's just going to go through this idle state and then exit. But as soon as you set this execute variable here to true, it will go to the next state. And then depending on the transitions for each of these states, one cycle at a time, or maybe longer if it's waiting for something. Now, by calling the SQL for automation functions, this block will put together a select string, wait for the response and then parse it, and finally reset and get back to its idle state. Now, our main goal is to connect our PLC to the database, and we're going to do that with the SQL for automation connector. Now, the connector will take the request from the PLC and send them over to the database. So as a first step, I'm going to connect the connector to the database. To do that, I open the configurator, connect it to the connector, create a new link, enter a name, and very important, because I'm using Siemens, make sure that I select Siemens as my target type. Next, I'll select the IP of the connector, the port, and then finally, the data source I want to use. If you don't know how to set up one, you can watch our fifth video. Then we click OK, activate a test license, and we should have our connection. So now the only thing missing is the connection from the PLC to the connector. So in order to do that, we need to tell our PLC where the connector is running and which link we want to use. So let's go back to our PLC and open the cyclic interrupt block. Now in here I can tell my PLC everything it needs to know. I can enter the connector IP and the connector port. Then I'm also going to check if the hardware ID is correct. And you can find it by going to device configuration, selecting the device you're connecting to, system constants, and it should be listed here. Now in some cases you might need to change some of these other settings as well, but most of the time it should work like this. Just one setting I want to point out is this one here. If you remember from before, our PLC is continuously cycling through the main OB, but every 10 milliseconds it gets interrupted by the cyclic interrupt block. That's where our S4A function block is. And it won't return until after it's finished with that one. So if we don't have any requests at the moment, it won't take long. And switch between these two blocks at regular intervals. But now every time we do send a request, the PLC will stay longer at the S4A block. For example, 22 milliseconds. And during that time, our main program won't be able to process anything. So if it's for example waiting for a sensor, and that sensor gets triggered directly after we go to our S4A function block, it won't be able to detect that sensor until after we're finished. So we could have a delay of 21 milliseconds in here. And this is where our setting comes into play. To minimize that delay, we can set this parameter to 5 milliseconds, for example. And with that, our S4A block will only be allowed to work for 5 milliseconds at a time. So this delay will then never be above 5 milliseconds, but on the other hand, it will of course also take longer to process the request. So yeah, you might have to find a compromise between these two. 
So let's right click our CPU, compile software rebuild all. And then again, download to device, software all. Then load. Tell it to start the CPU and we're done. To test the connection we can use the examples in our project and an easy way to do it is by opening one of these watch tables we prepared. So I'm just going to open the select example and then to send the command we go online and monitor the values. And as you see our program says it's ready so that's good. Now we can start it by setting the execute variable here to true. And you can type in one to prepare the value and modify it afterwards or you can use right click and modify value to one or you could use this shortcut which is the fastest way. And here we go, here's the data from our database. Now to verify that we really are accessing our database I'm gonna start the management studio. And then I connect to the server, open my sample database and the table and should see this data. Now using my normal typing speed I can type in a request which will edit the text of the last entry. And we can see if that worked by refreshing the list. It did. And then when we send our select request again we should see this change. Which we do. Now what else can we do? We could also change the data using our PLC. But maybe first let's create a backup table. To do this I'm gonna right click our table and create a new one based on it. And as you can see, I can't with this login, so I'll connect to the server using another login. Then I just do the same thing again. Execute it. And after refreshing, I should see my new table. Now this table won't have any data in it yet, so I'll also have to copy the data from our old table. To do this, I'm going to use the insert query, which looks like this, and change it so it inserts into the new table all the values from the old one. Then we can execute and we should have our backup table. Okay, now we're prepared. To make changes to the database from the PLC, we can use our update example. Here we can change the parameters and we could execute it, but we don't really know what it's going to do now, right? So before that, we should maybe first take a look at what it's going to send. Now, if you go to our function block, we can see how our request will be put together. And you see it's going to update the table 1 and set the parameter 1 to parameter 1, parameter 2 to parameter 2 and so on, where the ID is below the ID we give it. So yeah, if I have it set at 290, it's going to update every entry below 290. And that's probably not what we want. Instead, we update all the entries and see what happens. Okay, maybe that wasn't our best idea. We kind of destroyed our database. But since we do have a backup, we can get our data back from there. We just have to delete this stuff first. And guess what? We can do this with our PLC. Just open the delete example, modify this parameter, and as soon as we execute it, our data should be gone. But first, let's check the syntax real quick. We can see in here that it's going to delete everything from a table 1, where the ID is below the ID we give it. And because I've set this parameter way above 300, it should delete everything. So let's execute it. There we go. Now to get the data back we just do the same thing we did before with the backup. Right click our backup table and then we want to insert into our old table all the data from our backup table. So now I could just execute this and be done. But what if this happens again in the future? Another way to do it would be by creating a store procedure out of this. And these can make our program a lot more flexible because after setting them up you can easily make changes to the queries without changing any of the PLC code. But I'll leave that for another video. So if you don't want to miss that you can subscribe to our channel and if you have a question about this video or something else you can just write it in the comments below. Anyway I hope this was helpful, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next tutorial.